Uh, that slide uh, shows the symptoms of Rhizotania bear patch, which if you're an agronomist or a farmer in a low to medium rainfall area, is no doubt a familiar sight to you. Uh, today I'm going to present some outcomes of uh, several GRDC funded projects uh, that are also jointly funded with SAGIT. And uh, there's a list of people involved in these programs that I won't go through all, more at the moment. The talk today, the outline, I'm going to cover uh, firstly inoculum dynamics and with the use of the DNA tests that we use in predictability we can now actually track what happens to rhizoctonia in the field. Also talk about disease development, so that's the impact of the fungus on the plant and what's in the pipeline. Okay, the first thing that um, is quite important is that we've now been able to show conclusively that, ro that rotation does have an effect on rhizotonia. In fact, Leon Mudge started observing back in the early 2000s that his wheat crops after canola were doing significantly better than uh, wheat in other parts of the rotation. And we followed that work on Leon's place for five years and it looked pretty compelling. The work of the recent Rhizotonia project that uh, Gupta has been heading up has had sites on Air Peninsula, in the Murray Mallee and in southern New South Wales. And it has shown conclusively that uh, canola does reduce the amount of Rhizotonia in the paddock. So here in 2009, this is an example of some of the results. This is from Streaky Bay. We started out with reasonably high levels of Rhizotonia in the trial site. Uh, in 2010, following canola, the rhizotonia level had dropped down to quite a low level, both after canola and also in grass-free pasture. When those plots were then sown back to wheat, the rhizotonia then very quickly increased back up into the high-risk uh, high categories. So the impact of these uh, so-called break crops lasts for only one year. The other thing I guess we should add is that we think that it's, it's the grasses and cereals in general that seem to be the major hosts of rhizotonia. Okay, so what happens? At the start of the season, if you're starting out with a rhizotonia level around about, say, 150, that dotted red line is the high-risk category for predictor B. If you grow wheat, the amount of inoculum in the plots increases slowly through winter and then increases exponentially through the spring. So rhizotonia historically has been considered a disease of seedlings, but in fact it's much more active throughout the spring months than it is in the, in the early part of the year. What you see as a bare patch is actually the impact of the rhizotonia on the plant. When you grow canola and grass-free pastures, what happens is you don't get this exponential increase in the spring. So it's not that canola isn't attacked, it just doesn't seem to have the root systems that support that multiplication of the fungus. So now if you move into the summer months, if you get no rain in summer, that high level of rhizotonia coming out of the cereal crop is maintained. And this situation actually happened in the spring droughts of 2008-2009. If you have canola, you have a low level coming out of the canola and similarly it doesn't change. If you look at the Predictor B results in 2008-2009, these were following you know, dry <coughs> summers. The red dots indicate samples in the high risk category. So you can see throughout the Murray Mallee virtually everything was red. In fact, I can remember samples coming in from those regions, virtually all of them had DNA readings around 900 to 1,000 and one Pratolancus per gram of soil. And there was very little variation across the whole area. If we get a significant summer rainfall event, and that's a rainfall event probably at least 20 millimetres, um, after the plants have dried off, this is post plant maturity. What happens is the rhizotonia level, inoculum levels drop. Now, if there's no other significant rain event for at least four weeks, the rhizotonia actually starts to recover. So what we think happens is that in warm, wet soil, rhizotonia is outcompeted by the other soil microbial components of the soil, so it's not very competitive um, against the other bugs that are basically breaking down the stubble, etc. If, however, you get a continuous 
rain events as we've had in the last couple of seasons and the soil doesn't dry out and in this situation it's a paddock that's kept weed free, rhizotonia levels continually drop and they can actually drop to quite low levels. It's down to the side, it's a bit easy to see. So it's possible for those levels to drop down to what we consider as a high risk category. The other thing I should have said with the earlier fluctuations is that if you get these fluctuations at the very high level, remember that's what we see as the high risk category for predictive weed. So to a certain extent those fluctuations are academic. But when they do drop down to quite low levels then it does have a significant impact on disease in the crop. That situation happened in 2010 and 2011 and these are the results of the predictor B for 2011, the last summer. You can see now that there are very little red uh, recordings throughout the Murray Mallee and into Victoria. In fact, uh, those last two years we were trying to find trial sites through the Murray Mallee. It was quite frustrating when you find a paddock sort of March, April and you just see the levels keep dropping until the trial sites went in. So we were quite concerned about the chances of getting significant yield responses. This is the results of some of the rotation trials that um, Gupta's program had uh, set up over the three years. And what I wanted to show was two things. Firstly, here you can see the variation between the peaks is due to the impact of the rotation on the rhizotonia levels. But the other thing is that the very big difference is between the seasons. And the impact of summer rainfall is as big as any of the rotational effects. So it's no wonder when you look back why it's been difficult for people to be confident about the impact of rotation on rhizotonia levels when you've got this seasonal factor over the summer confusing the issue. Another thing to notice is that between the regions you've actually got a significant difference. And this was at Streaky Bay. And this was particularly significant last year because whilst in 2010 and 11 at Waikaree the rhizotonia levels were low, in Streaky Bay they were actually still in the high risk category. Last year on the basis of um, the Wakeree results, we were making predictions that Rhizotonia wouldn't be uh, that bad in the 2011 season. And it turned out on the Air Peninsula that it was actually still quite serious. If we looked more closely at some of the early DNA results off Streaky Bay, we should have picked up that in fact the DNA levels coming out of Streaky Bay were still quite high. The reason for that is we think that the rainfall events on Streaky Bay, they still got significant summer rainfall events. They were further apart and the soil was drying out between the events and the rise of tonia levels didn't go down to the same extent. I put this slide in because it shows the importance of controlling the summer weeds. Now, there's more work going on with this to see whether the summer weeds are actually hosts or whether their primary role is to dry the soil out. And remember that in dry soil, that's where rhizotonia has its competitive advantage. But one thing is clear, that controlling the weeds does reduce the risk of rhizotonia damage in the crop. And this is a slide that uh, Lyndon Masters uh, sent me from a wheat crop that was grown this year, in the last 12 months. Here the summer weeds were controlled and you can see the health of that root system is significantly better than when the summer weeds weren't controlled. So whether the summer weeds are hosts or not is immaterial. It's important to keep those summer weeds under control in rise of tiny risk areas. Okay, the next part, looking at the seeding process. If you look at the distribution of rise of tiny in the soil profile at seeding, this is what we typically find. Most of the inoculum in a paddock that was kept weed free, this is a minimum till paddock, most of the inoculum sits in the top two and a half centimetres. It drops off exponentially as you go down the profile, so down at a bit below seven centimetres is actually very little rhizotonia. If you use knife points to sow the crop, five weeks into the crop, if you sample in the row of that crop, what you find is that the amount of rhizotonia in the row has dropped significantly compared to the areas between the row which are not disturbed. And as you go down the profile, you can see this um, pattern reproduced. Now with knife points, there are two things going on. The first one is, as these knife points are going through, 
What they're doing is tend to lift soil up from down the profile and throw it into the centre of the row. So they're actually lifting uh, soil that doesn't have much inoculum up the profile. That's one of the reasons why these levels are down as you go up, because they've effectively taken a lot of this soil and put it out of the row. The other thing they've done is they've shattered the row or caused soil disturbance, which has broken up the Rhizotonia hyphae, which has also set back the fungus. If you sow using a rippled coulter, what you see is that the Rhizotonia levels are higher than where you used a knife point. And in particular, as you get down into the two and a half to five, and even down to the five and seven and a half, those levels are significantly higher. The reason for that, we think, is firstly that a rippled coulter, instead of lifting soil up from below, it's actually pushing soil from the surface down the profile. So it's pushing inoculum down to where you don't want it, which is down near the root system. The other thing that, um, well, the ripple cooled is also giving some soil disturbance, so that's giving some benefit. The other thing about the, um, the <coughs> about the disc seeders is if there's any stubble on the surface, it'll tend to push the stubble down the profile, which again is not what you want. If you use a flat disc and you sow to only six centimetres, there's quite a dramatic effect. Instead of the inoculum going down, it actually nearly doubled in the same period. And that was in the top two and a half centimetres and even in the two and, a, two and a half to five. So when you get down to the five to seven, the disc was actually set in this sort of zone, so it hasn't had much effect in that area. Not quite sure exactly what's going on here. It, the first thing about the flat disc, though, is of course there's very little soil disturbance. So you'll have very little breaking up with the hyphal network. But those flat discs shouldn't be pushing too much inoculum down the profile, so I doubt that that's a key factor, but possibly what's happening is it's cutting a very narrow slit of soil disturbance and the rhizotonia is actually colonising back into that fairly quickly. It could also be that the slit that's cut set at 6 centimetres is not allowing the roots to get down the profile quickly and the rhizotonia is actually attacking those roots and building the inoculum. But that result begin, it starts to show why disc seeders have so much trouble with rhizotonia. Okay, disease development. That's what a healthy root system looks like. Just keep that in your mind. When you get rhizotonia, there are two main types of symptoms that are occurring. Here, virtually the whole root system is attacked. When that situation happens, you get bare patches in the crop. And that's the type of symptom that people are generally associated with rhizotonia. However, in the last couple of years, we've realised that there's also another type of symptom. And that is where if you get the crop in early, and particularly if it's sown a little deep, the seminal root system establishes quite well, and you don't get a lot of attack on those seminal roots. But what you do get is a lot of attack on the crown roots. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add, in this situation, uh, this often happens where you've got a constriction to the root growth. So if you've adopted things like cultivating deep, or you made sure there's no constraint to root growth, um, those roots can get down through the rhizotonia. But if you do have a, um, anything that slows the root development, it's those situations that will cause rhizotonia uh, to cause that sort of damage. <coughs> Okay, so in the modern farming system, we often sow on the break, even sometimes dry. What happens is the crops germinate very quickly. They get up, send a root system down, and you typically don't see bare patches in these crops. But what happens is when you get to around the tillering stage, if you look at these paddocks, you'll often see uneven growth in the paddock. And what's happening there is the rhizotonia is attacking the crown roots, and it's affecting the growth of the plant. If you're used to having bare patches in your paddock, that's a good result. And a lot of farmers, I'm pretty sure, that have had bad rhizotonia in the past, look at these paddocks and think that they've controlled rhizotonia. When you get to harvest, if you have a careful look at that paddock, superficially it looks all right. Except if you look carefully, you'll see these areas of the paddock of uneven growth, and they're actually right across the paddock. 
These are the type of paddocks that we've been doing work with with fungicides. Um, in Gupta's trial sites also, he's been looking at the relationship between those different types of symptoms and yield. So it's a bit of a no-brainer if you've got lots of bare patches in the paddock, it has a very high correlation between the amount of bare patch and the yield loss. But the relationship is something ridiculously high, got an R squared of 0.99. However, what wasn't fully appreciated until recently is that as you increase the percentage of crown roots, there's also a reduction in yield. And that's a little bit noisier. But if you look at the differences in the yield, there's quite significant yield losses. And that's the situation that's occurring in paddocks where you don't see bare patches. And it's those paddocks that we've been doing our recent work in on banding fungicides, which is the next part of the talk. Um, <coughs> there's a number of different collaborators in this. I won't go through all of them and I'll get into the talk itself. So what we're trying to do here is to ban fungicides in the soil. We're trying to protect both this primary root system and we're also trying to protect these crown roots. So in order to do that, we've been looking, or well, most of the work to date is focused on seed treatments. In some of the earlier trials that we did in the first GRDC project, we didn't get particularly consistent results with seed treatments. And Lyndon May uh, was lobbying pretty hard to say, look, in West Australia, a lot of growers are banding fungicides at depth. And at that time, it started to match up with the observations we're seeing in the crop of the different types of symptoms in the crop. So we've set up these trials, we've been banning fungicides right at the base of the furrow. We've also been placing fungicides right on the surface at seeding as a split application and various combinations. So this is an example of the summary, a brief overview of the first site that we set up in 2010. Five weeks after seeding, these plots are uh, Paired plot design, this, these three rows are untreated, these three rows are treated. Five weeks into the crop, there was no sign of rhizotonia. And this was a year when the rhizotonia levels were dropping. Went out and thought, oh hell, this is uh, not a good year, we're not going to get any symptoms in the crop. In fact, if you dug up those seedling roots and had a look at them, they were perfectly clean. There wasn't much evidence of damage at all. Three weeks later, though, the soil temperatures had dropped, and suddenly you could start to see that these three rows are tillering much better, they're more uniform. On these rows you can start to see the rows are getting thinner and this patch is starting to emerge. If you take plants or seedlings out of here and compare them to seedlings there, that's what they look like. So here we're actually getting quite severe damage to the root systems. In the fungicide treated areas we had quite healthy roots and we've even got crown roots starting to come out. If you go into that paddock again, 18 weeks up, so now into, into October, the effect is still there. If you take a second to get your eyes in, these three rows are treated, these three rows are untreated. Most people walking into a paddock that looked like that wouldn't think they had a rhizotonia problem. The difference in yield between the treated and untreated in that particular plot was 24%. And that was actually sown with the ripple cooler. If you dig the plants up from here and compare the root systems there, this is what they look like. Middle of October, the root systems on the untreated are actually being attacked quite severely by rhizotonia. So the concept that rhizotonia only attacks young roots is not right. What it's doing is it's actually recycling the root system uh, in mid-spring. And this is when all the inoculum is building up in the crop. So it's well and truly getting stuck into this root system. And that's the major feed source for that's driving the inoculum for next year. The fungicide treated plots, the primary root system is still in very good condition. We've even got crown roots coming off the plants. The protection up here was not quite as good as I would have liked. So in the next year we looked at banding treatments in the crop and I'll show you some of those results soon. So they're pretty impressive results for the first year. It was on the basis of that that we went back to GRDC and SAGIT and suggested that um, 
there'd be a greater effort put into this area to, de to develop up the fungicides. We've got, um, I was hoping it was one project, but it's been split into three. We've got projects with Syngenta and Bayer Crop Science as well. Um, and the idea there is to fast track some new products um, into the marketplace. And in particular, our work is focusing on getting efficacy data to, to support banding of these products um, to improve rhizoctonia control. Just quickly, going into that particular site in 2010, the untreated plots averaged 3.79 tonne. The top treatments, which was actually a knife point uh, combination top and banding top and bottom, yielded 4.26 tonne. So that was a 12.4% increase. It was quite significant. 2011, we set up a new series of sites. Uh, this time it was on non-wetting sand. It wasn't our intention to select a non-wetting site. In hindsight, though, it made sense because we were looking for sites that had high rise of tonia level in 2011. Again, a wet summer. And the paddocks that had the highest rise of tonia levels tend to be ones that were non-wetting, which in hindsight makes sense. Rise of tonia likes dry soil, and dry soils tend to be the non-wetting sands. Anyway, much the same thing happened. It's about five weeks after seeding. No particular evidence of rhizotonia damage. The plots germinated well. Um, in fact, they germinated better than the surrounding crop. Six and a half weeks, though, if you have, dig up the plants and have a look at them, you can see very quickly that rhizotonia now is getting stuck into these root systems again. Crown roots are gone. Fungicide treatments, top and bottom. We've got good seminal roots and we've got We've actually got some crown roots getting established. Um, at Anthesis, this is what the plots look like. There was a few issues at this site that we hadn't really come to grips with managing properly, and one of them was the nutrition aspects. Um, so firstly, this is that this time is these three plots or three rows that are treated. This is the untreated. If you look carefully, the treated plot is actually doing better. But what you'll notice is that at the back end of these plots, there is variation in the growth. And the fungicide treatments, um, we think, tend to give the biggest yield responses in those areas where the crops are growing reasonably well. So I think that what it means is that if you've got really bad bear patching and you've got issues of subsoil constraints or uh, water repellency, etc., Fungicides may not necessarily be enough to overcome those constraints, so you'll need to adopt current best practice to get the best out of the fungicides. Looking at the yields of those plots, the no fungicide treated averaged about 1.2 tonnes per hectare. If we manage the nutrition better at this site, that 1.2 probably should have been up closer to about 2 tonnes per hectare. So as a nutritional issue, which we didn't get right. However, if you look at the fungicide treatments, these two light blue ones are where we put fungicide at depth only. Now, because of the noise within that site due to the non-wetting, the low rate out-yielded the high rate. These four uh, histograms here are where we put fungicide at the surface and below the seed. So this one was the high rate split surface, same rate as that, but this half on the base of the furrow, half on the surface, we got a 16.2% yield increase. I told the Victorians it was 13.9, and when we went back, we actually made a calculation here. It was a little bit higher than we thought. These second histograms are where we were trying to, instead of putting on the fungicide at seeding, we're banding it in the crop six and ten weeks after seeding. The idea being to try and get better protection of those crown roots into the spring. As it turns out, we only had two major rain events at this site. One was two weeks after seeding, the other was four. So those two bandings in the crop didn't really have the opportunity to get moved into the soil profile. And the situation was made worse by the non-wetting properties of the sand. This combination here had low rate at surface, low rate at seeding, and an extra dose ten weeks afterwards. But that second dose didn't make any difference. Basically, those two plots are the same. 
The last four histograms are or bar graphs are the same treatments, but this time using a ripple coulter. What was interesting is that the low rate top and bottom only yield an 8.4% increase here instead of 16. And in 2010, those two yields are much closer together. So I suspect it's something to do with the non reading properties of this soil type that's made that disc seeder not work as well. Possibly it's the ripple coulter pushing non reading sand down the profile around the seed. But when you looked at the root systems, the fungicides had actually reduced the um, disease on the root systems here to comparable to those two treatments. So in theory it should have worked. So I said before, fungicides are looking very promising and I think they're going to enable us to recover the yield losses that we're getting with the current best practices for rhizotonia control. I have a feeling they're not going to be a silver bullet and that if you've got paddocks like this and you're waiting for fungicides to solve the problem, you probably would be disappointed because I think there are other subsoil constraints here that is enabling the rhizotonia to cause damage. Unless we address those, um, I suspect the fungicides won't necessarily give you an economic response. Disease prediction. If you look at the DNA levels in the plots of these sites before seeding and the amount of disease that develops in the crop, which is what we try to do with Predictor B, you find that there is actually not a bad relationship. So this is uh, results from three of the sites that Gupta had. So the relationship is R squared of about 0.5, which is not too bad, but there is a lot of variation uh, about those points. And you wouldn't expect, if we actually got a nice straight line, there'd be something wrong because we know that environment plays a key role uh, in the amount of disease that develops. So host is important, pathogen levels are important, but we know that there are environmental factors that are important. Soil type, uh, amount of rainfall, etc., has got to affect the amount of disease. The moment though we don't have a good way of in integrating the environmental components to improve the prediction of the predictive E results. So what we do in the agronomist training courses is we identify the seasonal conditions that we know make rhizoctonia worse in this case and the factors that are non-conducive in the other case. But we don't have a good way of integrating those results. In another GRDC project, which has been running for about 12 months, we're collaborating with the cropping systems groups in Western Australia and in Northern New South Wales to calibrate Predictor B for those regions. And what we're trying to do is to use the DNA results before seeding to explain the root health of the plants at about anthesis or late seedling stage. And what um, Grant Poole has done in this place, in case, working with those groups, first pass analysis, is that when he uses those results, plus takes into account regional differences. So when we are distinguish the regions based on historic uh, rainfall and temperature, and you put in soil type, you put in elevation, um, we haven't yet incorporated growing season rainfall and temperature, but we know that will be important you actually significantly reduce the variation of, or around the relationship between the DNA level and the disease prediction. So what we think may be possible is in a two, three years time is that we will be able to develop regional based models that will take those DNA results and then or well, the way I think it might work is we'll have something like a Google map front end where you zoom in on the paddock you click on the paddock, that will then preload a model with the parameters associated with that paddock, type in your DNA results, and then it will give you potentially three scenarios, a decile 2, decile 5, a decile 8 season conditions, and for each of those it will give you a, a risk to the root health in that crop. And we're hoping it will incorporate all the DNA results. If the risk is high in the season that you think is likely to happen, then you look at the results, identify the key um, pathogens driving that risk, implement strategies to reduce the impact of those on the crop. 
So we're quietly confident that this is going to work. We'll know better in another year or two's time. If it does work, we'll then bring that work back from the western, particularly in the western region, we'll bring it back and calibrate it for the southern region. So what still works, I won't go through these. Basically, it's the standard recommendations. Uh, in particular, barley is more susceptible than wheat. Triticalia notes are more tolerant. We still think that long-term disease suppression is a good objective. Uh, there's nothing that we've worked on at the moment that would stop people from trying to achieve that. What's new? Grasses and cereals are the main hosts of rhizotonia. Rhizotonia levels are driven by rotation, so it's continuous cereals at a risk. Damage to the crown roots causes uneven growth in the crop and it causes significant yield loss. Frequent summer rainfall events reduce inoculum in weed-free paddocks. From a management perspective, you can now be quite confident that if you're using grass-free canola, grass-free pastures, that will give you a benefit in terms of rhizotonia damage to the following wheat crop, but it'll only last one season. When you think about it, barley tends to follow wheat. Barley is also the most intolerant crop. You're really putting barley in a very tough situation in rhizo areas. Make sure from first-hand experience last year that you've addressed all your nutritional deficiencies, not just N. You have to look at the micronutrients as well. If you do nothing else this coming season and you've got growers that have got paddocks that are in rhizotonia risk areas, they think they're on top of it, but you notice uneven growth in the crop, go out in the middle of spring, dig up some plants from those crops. If they look like that, then start thinking about the possibility of using these fungicides in the next couple of years. And I reckon we're probably two to three years off some of these products being available. I was going to make some disease predictions for the year, but I think we're probably running out of time. And there's a string of other people involved in this project, so we've got quite a big team working on this. Questions? Thanks, Alan. We've got a few minutes for questions to start. Oh, I'll shout it out. Um, with the fungicides that you used, was there any noticeable um, Um, yeah, we've tried really hard to select sites with minimum risk of uh, leaf diseases because we don't want that com confounding the yield responses that we get. But we did notice in 2010 there was a bit of yellow leaf spot in the site and the product that we used there did give some protection for that for the first five weeks. So there is a possibility. The fungicides the reason that we put it right at the bottom of the furrow is most of these fungicides tend to move up the plant, they don't move down. So if you put them on a seed, for them to work well, they have to be washed off the seed down the profile and then picked up by the roots. So if you put it at the base of the furrow, the seeding, seeds germinate very quickly, send a root down and hit the fungicide layer. But then some of these products do move right up into the top of the plant. So there is a potential for leaf disease control. We've got a couple of questions on the screen there. Alan, you can read them out. For a standard double shoot seed, that adequately distribute fungicide by splitting fertile seed and below. Um, the systems that we're using at the moment are the liquid systems for putting out liquid fertilisers. Um, one of the treatments that we had last year was a fungicide coated fertiliser and that did look promising. I'm not sure, we haven't done this work, so I can't answer it directly, but the systems that we're looking at would be a single line to the time, split it, you'd have a jet sitting behind the press wheel, and the other one would be a drip line straight to the bottom of the furrow. So the technology that we're using is off-the-shelf technology, it's available now. Um, and I think the other possibility is we could tank mix these things with um, nutrients and possibly other products in the future. Alan, you talked about that sort of six week and even later, like I think a 10 week timing application as well. What, how do you think that'll be done? Um, the only way you can do that is with guidance. And there are jets that are used, I think, for putting out liquid fertilisers in the crop. 
That will be more difficult to do for most growers, but it is technically possible these days. So it's, it's possible that in, say, wheat following canola, by the time wheat gets through to maturity after canola, the rhizo levels actually build up again on the crown roots. Um, there may be a benefit of banding fungicide late in the season in a, a wheat after canola, but that's something we haven't done yet. But if we can get the protection up front at seeding, then that's obviously a lot easier. There's a question there about which fungicide is showing promise. Uh, we're only working with two fungicides at the moment, and these are both uh, products under development. Um, we've had inquiries from another company about putting products in for evaluation. So these are new chemistries, they're not uh, products that are out there at the moment. So at this stage, what we're uh, showing you is that these products actually are giving us some quite interesting responses and I think uh, because of the GRDC, GRDC investment we're hoping these products will be available to growers within uh, several years so not too far down the track. Alan, are there any other fungicides that are available at the moment that might give a similar response? On the market? Um, well, there are products registered on the market. We haven't evaluated those as, uh, for banding. And I think placement is actually important. But there are a number of products that, got it, that do actually work on rhizotone. They do control it. But I think it's actually where you put the fungicides is important. So we need to do the work to see which ones work as a, a banded product. So what are they? Are they things like the uh, no, I think the only one you'd, you'd look at at the moment is uh, the seed treatment. But, but again, it hasn't been looked at in this situation. So this placement thing might explain some of the erratic response we'll see with some of those seed dressings that are claimed to control. Well, I think the seed treatments, when you look at it carefully, they work better in the higher rainfall areas. Um, we, got, we did get some significant seed treatment responses this last season. Went back and checked the rainfall figures and we had a significant rain event within two weeks of sowing. So I think that was significant. Okay, Emma. Alan, have you got any comments on the use of these fungicides and um, the speed of achieving su uh, disease suppression? Is it going to slow it up or speed it up? Um, well, I guess if we get better dry matter production of crops, it'll speed it up. We have been looking at the impact of the fungicides on the soil biology and there is a reduction um, when you apply the fungicides as we apply them but I guess the advantage of the banding is it's only in the strip so it's only we're minimizing the impact by banding it and the impact is wearing off towards the end of the season. What drives the soil biology is the amount of carbon you put back into the system so the bigger the crop uh, the faster you'll develop disease suppression if you're going to develop it. Uh, 